So I said, let's go see these guys. And, and Jeff said, yeah. So we went. And here's what happened. We went into a meeting of something called the Indian Friendship Society. And we were at a table with about 50 guys. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was me and Jeff and a bunch of pleasant people, people from the church, social workers, and so on. And once again, these Native Indians rolled out this idea of a halfwit house. We want to start a sort of halfway house. And here's what they wanted to do. Self-government, self-financing, self-determination. Here was the problem. For two years, people came in and patted them on the head and said, oh, that's a good idea, boys. <laughs> but in the afternoon, I suffered from low blood sugar. So in high school, I never learned anything about history or geography. To this day, I know nothing about history and geography. Math, I'm a wizard at, because that was in the morning, when I just had my breakfast. In the afternoon, nothing. What happens to me in the afternoon is I get the giggles. I start laughing. Almost anything will set me off. So these guys are talking about, we want to start this place, and it's got self-determination, it's self-financing, and so on, and I start laughing. Holy smokes, they look at me like, well, who is this idiot? And the leader, a guy named Clarence, he says, what are you laughing at? <laughs> the guards, because, because the guards were standing on a, a, a balcony around the rim of the library. This was in the library. I'm not making this up. The guards suddenly activated their guns. And the room was like ice all of a sudden. And I was too stupid to be afraid. I was young. I was naive. I was brash. And to me, it was just funny. So I said, I'm laughing at you guys. <laughs> what? <laughs> What do you mean you're laughing at us? I said, what are you talking about? Self-government, self-financing, self-determination. If you had the faintest idea what those words meant, you wouldn't be in here. How can you say that, said the leader. I said, let me tell you what's going to happen after this meeting. When this meeting is over, I and my store-bought clothes, I'm going to walk out of here. I'm going to get into my Ford two-door hardtop. I'm going to drive to my apartment where I've prepaid the rent three months in advance. I'm going to take some coffee beans from a wonderful little shop on Robson Street called Murchie's. I'm going to grind the coffee beans. I'm going to make a fresh pot of coffee. I'm going to take a tailor-made cigarette out of the package and smoke it. That's what I'm going to do. Let's look at what you're going to do. You're going to march single file in those blue jeans and the brown wool jacket with the number on the tip to a little squirrel cage. And if you had any brains, you may have worked up some sort of a plug to heat some water. And you're going to get rollings all over your pants trying to make a cigarette. That's very different. Talk to me, please, about bacon and eggs and shoes and socks, because it's the only thing I understand because I'm a very practical, stupid guy. The point of that story is that even though we had a conflict, we actually connected. We had a confrontation that was mano-mano, but meant we respected each other. I did not do this deliberately. It wasn't a strategy. It wasn't a plan. It was just 24-year-old David at the time reacting. I just reacted. So Jeff and I went away, and we said, that's interesting. That's an interesting thing. So then I went back by myself once. I went back, and I had another meeting with these guys. And I said, I'm willing to try and work with you guys if you want to try and do this. And they said, yes. I went out into my car, and I drove onto the freeway. And I got about one mile at the time. This is before kilometers. And I had to pull the car over because I was sobbing uncontrollably. And all I could think was, I know that these men have done something wrong. But I don't care what they did. That is a house of pain. That is an evil place. And we have to tear the walls down. Of course, we never did, but someone eventually did tear the walls down. Not me. So, 
how did I think that I would do this, or why would I do this? Well, I was driving a taxi. My job was taxi driving and dispatching a taxi. My other friends already had their PhDs from university. My other friends were going to university. I have my second mother here visiting tonight. My dear friend Myrna, she's in her 90s. My mother has passed away, but Myrna is the mother of a childhood friend of mine. And Myrna, my whole life, has been kicking my butt because I never graduated. But her children have all graduated, and that's most of my friends went to university. But I left university because I had ants in my pants. I couldn't stay there. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to do things and so on. So here I was, living in Vancouver, smoking a lot of pot, drinking a lot of wine, practicing at least the 200 versions of sex that I could figure out. <laughs> Wait a minute, just a minute, just a minute. 201. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? I never thought of that. You see? <laughs> I, I wouldn't let people know that you know this stuff. <laughs> And I was having a lot of fun, but aside from having fun, I was lonely, and I was miserable, and I was frightened. I lived in a little apartment by myself, I worked till 2 or 3 in the morning, I came home, I read, I played the saxophone, I went to bed, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't a great life. So I knew I had to do something. I knew I was smart, I knew I had talent, I knew I had energy. And I had to attach myself to something worthwhile. And I thought, why not this? We'll see what happens. Here's what happened. On January 5th, 1967, I drove my car into a lockup. Here's what happens. The gate goes up, and you drive your car in, and there's a gate in front of you, and the gate goes down, and you are trapped in this guardhouse. So there I am. I get out of my car, and the guard looks at me, and I'm 24 years old. I have this big, thick Mexican mustache, and I got hair down to here, and I'm wearing Mexican sandals, and I look like some crazy beatnik. And he, the guard says to me, what are you doing here? I said, I'm waiting for an inmate. He says, what's the guy's name? I said, Richard. I told him his name. He looks at me. He says, you are waiting for Richard? I said, yes. He says, what for? I said, well, not that it's any of your damn business. We're going to go start a halfway house. In his life, he never heard anything funnier than this. He is on the floor weeping with laughter. I gave him the biggest entertainment he ever had. He says, do you know this guy? I said, no, I don't know this guy. He said, do you, do you know what his, his nickname is in the joint? No, I don't. His nickname is Crazy Horse. Okay. Do you know what he's doing time for? I said, I don't, I don't want to know. I'm not interested. He's a killer. I said, really? Yes, he killed a guy in a knife fight. Whatever. <laughs> I'm 24. I'm stupid. I'm not afraid. I don't care. I, I'm focused. I have a job. We're going to start halfway house. Richard comes out. He walks like a bear. He rolls like this. This is Richard. <laughs> He's got scars on his scars. His scars have scars. He gets in the car. I start heading out of the prison. He says, we have to go to Newton. I said, Newton? What's Newton? Where's Newton? He said, I don't know. It's in Surrey. I said, for what? He says, well, I have to visit my partner's mother. I said, look, I don't know what you're talking about. We're going to rent a house. Now, imagine me telling this guy anything. Okay? So we go, and we find a house on Nanaimo Street that has a for rent sign. Now picture this. There's me. I'm this little Jewish boy from the north end of Winnipeg. I got this mustache, this long hair, and this big nose. And there's Richard, the native Indian from northern BC, a carrier Indian with this scar face, who's just got out of the joint an hour ago. Door opens, lovely 